Great, and we're live. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, for those that are watching in Europe, and good morning for those who are on the West Coast in the U.S. My name is Lisette, and I'm interviewing people and companies doing great things remotely. And today, I'm very excited, we have Adriana Vela. Adriana, you're the founder of Nanotech Nexus, and when I looked it up on the website, the mission statement said, you're transforming how individuals learn about nanoscience and inspiring K-12 through students to pursue STEM education and careers. So fabulous, fabulous mission. I'm excited to talk to you about that, and uh, we'll also get into your virtual office space. So welcome, Adriana. Thank you so much, Lisa, for having me. I really appreciate this. And this is exciting, and, and I love to be able to have this conversation with you. Great. Well, let's start with, let's talk a little bit about Nanotech Nexus and what, what this organization does and what you do with this, because I think that this subject of STEM education and careers, this is important and, uh, and needed. So I'm curious yeah. to hear more about that. Absolutely. And, and this is, uh, it, it's, it's funny the way uh, this all came about, but 10 years ago, I started an organization called Nanotech Nexus Inc. And my, my purpose and mission was for the benefit of industry. So I've always tracked technology trends, and I knew that the, um, uh, that the, that the trend t was towards miniaturization, of course, um, in, in 20 years of spending my time in the high-tech industry. But when the Human Genome Project was uh, was defined, I knew at that time, it's like, that's the light bulb. It's like, okay, it's the convergence of life science and technology and miniaturization. So the natural thing was nanotechnology. So I started paying attention to that. And... Um, and, and at that time, in 2004, I founded NanoBioNexus, and it was all about studying the industry um, and applications for applying nanotechnologies to life science, from therapeutics to diagnostics to medical devices. And that was fascinating. Um, but again, I was working with research institutes, doing consulting services, doing educational forums, bringing companies doing interesting things uh, in that space, and sharing it with, with industry, with industry professionals. So I was just stimulating collaborations and knowledge and awareness. So that was great. In the back of my mind, I always thought we need to. Uh, I always thought that the ecosystem uh, heavily comp uh, comprises of. Uh, obviously, the uh, academic research institutes, industry, and general public, and the, the next generation, which is our K through 12. So I've always had a philanthropic bent, and it wasn't until last year that I finally decided, you know, I can't just do that on the side, the K through 12 things. I have to really put some real effort into it. So I launched a new organization called Nanotechnics' Learning Group, and it's a sister company. So now I'm taking those 10 years of industry experience and applying it in a way that we want to bring the relevance of this exciting technology field and, and inspire the K through 12, the next generation of innovators, basically. We need right. to see that because we have a shortage of STEM professionals. At the rate that we're going, we're already going to be like, a, a, we're already like a million STEM professionals short in the next 10 years. Wow. So we have this. We need to address this shortage if we want to continue to uh, apply this in a way that it helps to solve the vast majority of society problems, from environment to medical to aerospace. It doesn't matter. It touches all area, all industries, and it touches all areas of our life. So um, we're in the early stages, developing some programs. Um, internship programs, content, but repackaging it for the audiences of K through 12. And we want to do it in a different way. And this is why I call the mission transforming the way we learn about it. So we want to, we want to uh, create programs that allow people to learn about this in an incidental way, not here, read this white paper, because nobody really wants to do that. Right, right. So, uh, so we're... Well. They probably want to get their hands on something. They want to dive in and really understand it probably. I mean, I don't know. I've been far, I'm far from K through 12 these days. <laughs> so it's hard to remember actually, but it seems like that would be exciting. Well, yes, hands-on uh, is, is absolutely the best way to learn. But how do you do hands-on when you're talking about something that you can't even see with regular microscopes? Right. Right, because it's right. at the nanoscale. It's it's smaller. It's at the atomic and, and subatomic levels, 
and therefore we need to figure out a creative ways of doing that. We have some some plans, some product development, uh, early pilots that we're working on that we hope to be able to uh, share uh, further as as we as we get some funding for it and as we uh, progress and and further build those teams. But we're we're relatively early stage still. Super interesting. I'm going to be following this to, to watch what happens. I think this is particularly fascinating. I mean, think of what we could solve with the technologies that we have these days. So I can, I can imagine how motivating this must be to work in this field. Absolutely. So let's tell me then about what your virtual team looks like or your virtual office. Give, give us a picture of, of what that looks like. Absolutely. Well, um, the over the last 10 years, we've certainly evolved, but I've always had uh, te remote teams. Um, some teams, I had some offices in Arizona, in the Bay Area, while I was uh, in San Diego. So um, having remote teams is, is something that's really common to me, even when I was in the high-tech uh, high industry in corporate America. So it, it's a natural to just extend that. And because I have contacts everywhere, I'm always looking for the right person is, is what matters first, regardless of where they are. And, and so through my contacts, you know, you look for like-minded people. And uh, then we use the tools to be able to communicate and collaborate. So um, I've had teams pretty much uh, everywhere today. Most of my team is in San Diego. I am in Washington State, and also I commute a lot to San Diego. I have one person in New Jersey. I have one person in uh, Toronto, Canada, and I have um, one person in the Bay Area. Am I forgetting somebody? Um, I think that that's. <laughs> I think that's it for right now. Oh, oh, I do collaborations as well with a, team, a, a couple of a company and an, a research institute in Florida. Okay, wow. So there's a lot of different places, all relatively close in the same time zone, relatively. But as we learned today, it, things can go awry with time zones at any time and also with professionals who are used to time zones. And I mentioned this as I as I misscheduled our meeting because I miscalculated a very simple time zone and I thought, oh, geez, I'm the, I'm one of the experts in here, you know, I missed it again. So <laughs> yes, it's like, happen. absolutely. And, and not a problem. Uh, somebody who has lived through that and has uh, gone down that road and made the exact same um, goof, <laughs> I'll call, I'll call it. Uh, I certainly understand that. And uh, that just reminds me of, of a time I was in Grenoble um, in, in, in France and I was working for Hewlett Packard at the time. And I was actually a little bit under the weather uh, at the time, and I remember calling my, my boss and seeing if I could just, you know, cut the, the, the trip short. And, um, and, and I, so I called him up, and I said, you know, I said, Doug, I'm so sorry. I, I, I hope I'm not interrupting your dinner, you know, but I really wanted to talk to you about this. And the first thing he says is, Adriana, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> You could have just imagined, like, oh, the energy just, I'm like, oh, rat. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. it happens, and I'm like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And that's when I realized oh, I miscalculated the, the time, obviously. But it, it happens, and, and um, it, it, to the best of us. So all you need to do is just laugh it off, roll, up, roll with the punches and laugh it off, uh, because even when I traveled a lot to South America, I would wake up in the morning in some ho in, in, in my hotel, not some hotel, in my hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't wrong, story. <laughs> I don't want to give the wrong impression. You know, I would wake up in my hotel room and um, I'd, I'd, the first thing in my mind was, okay, what country am I in today? It wasn't wow. what time things, like what country, because I was doing jumping through all the different countries you know, one or two days, you know, in each one. So I'd have to really think, before, even before coffee, what country am I in today? And that's when you start thinking about, you know, your activities for that day. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like um, in terms of why you went remote or why you had remote teams, if, I, if, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, it's because you were looking for the right people 
for the job. And I can imagine that in this field with nanoscience and nanotechnology that those people are not all in the same place. I mean, it's probably they're all over the place. Yes, they, they are. And you always want to look for best of breed and, and who's doing exciting things. So um, it, it's where, wherever they happen to be. There are, of course, clusters that, that, that occur at some of the top universities. I mean, there is a lot in, in, in San Diego, but from a nanotechnology perspective, that's definitely not necessarily, you know, the majority of them by any means. And I never live it myself to just one area and just one, one, one relatively small backyard. The world is much bigger than that. Indeed, indeed, especially when you're trying to get the best people together. So is there anything then, besides time zones, is there anything that's particularly challenging for your team or the things that you guys really struggle with because you're remote? Um, you, well, you know, certainly I, I remember when I used to travel uh, like 50 to 75% uh, of, of the time when I was in corporate America. And at that time, because my, my audiences were C-level C executives, CTOs, CIOs, uh, for that, face to face is always absolutely the best thing, and therefore we earned uh, the the my my peers uh, and I were known as road war well road warriors, but sometimes we were really known as roadkill as well because we were <laughs> we were um, you know ragged uh, a lot of times. But uh, so face to face is is always the best. But with with the technologies now of uh, video conferences. That's like the next best thing. And I, and I think uh, the market and professionals out there have come a long way to uh, embrace that, that technology. There's still some people that are a little bit nervous and uncomfortable because it's relatively new to them. But once they start getting used to it, it's, it's definitely not a problem. As a company leader and soliciting or recruiting teams, it's incumbent upon me to make it as easy as possible. So I have to master the tools first and bring them along. Um, and having said that, you want to also be savvy um, about it, um, identifying who might be the right sort of profile of, of um, team members. Uh, they have to be at least willing to try. They have to have that courage if they don't already have experience. Clearly, if they have experience, that's great. That's one, one hurdle. But if you have to be bringing them along so much that you have to handhold everything then and, and they're not really picking up, then that's probably not a good match. Right. So, so finding the right people just from a, a knowledge perspective is part of it, but the other is having it be workable, having, uh, having them be comfortable with that kind of, uh, of environment. And for that, it really takes a lot of discipline. Um, it's, it's, it's not that different from the consultant mind frame. Um, not everyone can be a, an independent consultant, even if they think they can. Right. Uh, because some people really do better in a structured environment. You go into your, a, a, a brick and mortars place, you put in your time, and then you're done, even if you do some work at home afterwards. But that's really different than when you have to structure your projects and you have to keep yourself in, in, in line. You have to uh, manage that and manage other, other people as well. So it, it requires some uh, a discipline of of structuring yourself in putting in the work, putting in the time. Right. And I can imagine that um, I know in my experience that there's been people that have said, I've never worked remotely before, but I'm sure it's not a problem. Like they think because you're in your pajamas, supposedly that it's easy. And I think I, that always is my red flag where I think, hmm, it's, you know, it's not as easy as you think. Yes, you're at home or wherever you happen to be traveling, but, uh, but it's not, it's not just about, <laughs> it's not it's not as easy as people think there's definitely personality tools all kinds of things that come into play there yeah it, absolutely and, and in fact uh if that's the first thing that comes to their mind as like you said that's a big red flag because actually part of the discipline is first getting yourself ready as if in, in the mindset of work and it really takes a pro to be able to have that mindset while you are let's say quote unquote in your pajamas 
Um, so to give you an example of, of some of my uh, remote um, or mobile offices, they can vary. They can, uh, because I've been at this for, for so long and I have the discipline, they can vary from uh, obviously airports, uh, bars at the, at the airports, uh, as long as I have uh, power, that's, you know, I'm plugging my, my computer, I'm golden. I'll order a beer and I'm like just working away or having a conference call. And that's, and that's great. But I can shut out the, the, the world around me. And not everyone can necessarily do that. They'll get distracted or frazzled or can't concentrate. For me, I can have a sc uh, screaming kid, you know, uh, two seats away and it, I don't even think about it. And um, even when my kids were younger and I was working, um, somebody else would take, would, you know, would address the, their needs if they, if they were making noise or something, because I was focused. Um, so other, other remote uh, office areas could be, I could be in Maui in my bed looking at this great scenery in, in, in front of me with the big windows and I'm working. And this is early in the morning before everyone else is up. So because of the time zone. So I take advantage of that time. But I, I can do that. Or, or else it could be at my mountain home in Southern Oregon. And, you know, again, great views. And I'm not ready to really tackle the day yet with hiking or something. I'll just work in the morning and sometimes I end up being there till 11 o'clock in the morning, but still in bed in, with my little uh, uh, tabletop, um, remote little tabletop and put my computer on there so it doesn't overheat. And um, so, so it, or a poolside, you know, I'm on vacation somewhere in Florida, poolside. And now the computers are better with regards to the glare. So, All right, good point. Oh, which, by the way, a lot of that is due to nanotechnology and use of quantum dots in your, in your screens. Awesome. <laughs> way to bring it around. I love it. <laughs> but it's a good reminder for people to know. I mean, technology has come a long way in the last, ten, even the last five years, but in the last 10 years, it's come a long way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, making it a lot easier. So you said something um, um, about tools. I wanted to get onto the tools subject because I'm curious, what tools does your team use to work together and communicate together? Well, um, so, you know, clearly uh, laptops are great instead of desktops uh, at, the, at the very minimum. But um, there's software tools and there's, and there's hardware tools. So, you know, obviously the software tools will be like this product, Zoom, uh, or I use GoToMeeting, you know, for my remote meetings. And, uh, but there's, there's so many tools out there, file sharing, Dropbox, um, but hardware wise, you, when you're on the road, you, the, the tendency would be to, well, you know, you need to pack everything, pack the kitchen sink. And uh, trust me, you don't want to do that because it gets heavy, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but there are certain tools that I, I always carry in, in my, um, rolling bag. And you also want to have a combination of different rolling bags depending on where you're going. Um, I remember my rolling bag, uh, which is probably, which is pretty, pretty deep. So you can put files in there and, and also has a remote, uh, not a, a, a separate computer bag. So you can be lighter if you need to just go in without your big rolling bag. But I remember using my rolling bag and I was at, at this conference in San Francisco, which is very crowded. And because you're rolling it behind you, there's all these other execs tripping on my bag because you can't see it's, it's crowded. Oh, They're right. tripping. That's when you don't want to be using, <laughs> using a rolling bag. So a backpack is actually much better or a lighter bag. Um, I always carry either extra batteries, uh, but a, a tool that I think has been, it, it's very simple, but has been very helpful is a label printer or a little printer for labels interesting this, this is a, this is one of my old batteries i know it, it, i'll read to you what it says but it's just one of my old, old batteries and it just says adriana's extra battery old hp laptop battery <laughs> and basically it's like this way i know okay this is not the battery i need for that particular computer so you want to label your things you want to label your cords my power cord has adriana's uh, a power cord uh, because sometimes when my husband and I travel I don't want him to take mine or vice versa and I always have duplication so duplication I have my power cord uh, at my desk 
my, but I have a separate one that's always on my in my bag. Right. So one right. less thing that you have to pack. Um, always carry. Let's see. If you don't have um, a backlit keyboard on your laptop, these are great. These uh, LED uh, USB LED lights. They're flexible. They're bendable, and you can actually light your keyboard very easily. It's great for working in the plane, in the plane, and without having to have the big light um, above you. I always carry a remote mouse because uh -huh. you you never know when you're going to have a meeting with a client. If you have, if you're going to be sitting in the right place, uh, and your computer's going to be far away, or uh, if you want to be standing around and moving around, you want to have the freedom to be able to just use a remote mouse. Headsets, and, um, and then of course, this is my little pack of single serve medications, whether it's antacids, uh, aspirin, you right. know, things like that, because, uh, or a small uh, first aid kit. Because you're on the road, you can't be uh, facing something and then have to go find a drugstore somewhere. So being on the road means being as efficient and self-sufficient as possible. And the other thing that is that I do always, without a doubt, is um, just in case, even though I have a smartphone, I print out my, my itinerary, my car rental uh, agreement, so I have the uh, reservation codes, and I have this on the outer pocket of my computer bag because it's handy. So it's uh, airline, my itinerary, uh, car rental, hotel and anything any other really specific uh, item and if this is for my last trip I had my speeding ticket that I needed to take care of as well that I was going to take care of you know on that next trip so um, this way it's it's just handy and once I'm done with it it also serves for, as my documentation for my expense reports so I already have it Right. Yes, I can look it up online, but if it's slow or servers down or what have you, and I, when you have thousands of emails that that come in, you, you know you don't want to spend time searching. Right. For that, so so those are some of the tips that I do or use um, on a every every single time. And I travel right now at least one week, if not two weeks, a month. Wow. And I must say, I love these tips for how to be on the road because I think people don't realize how unproductive being on the road can be if you're not prepared for the types of work that you can do in the various locations. I mean, maybe you could do some kinds of work in an airport, but then other kinds of work by the pool or other kinds of work in the hotel. You have to really plan for it. So I love the, the efficient and self-sufficient mm -hmm. aspect of that. Awesome. Awesome, yeah. really, for how to be on the road. So we talked a little bit about what, what challenges your team faces, but I want to ask, what, what is it that your remote team does really well? What's something that you guys just excel at? Um, well, I think that uh, now that we've uh, been together for a while, uh, they, they all really do come to the table, you know, vir the virtual table, and are prepared with what they need to share. It's, it starts with uh, me setting the expectation and saying, okay, this is, these are the, you're gonna have 15 minutes and these are the things that we want to, uh, that I'm looking for in terms of a project status update, for example. What's, what's the um, latest on your project? What are some challenges or issues occurring? And then what are the next steps? So if everyone follows that format, then we're all, where all of us can be up to speed more easily, more efficiently, provide feedback, ideas. And so that, that works really well. And I, I'm really, really proud of, the, of how that's going. And um, we just had our um, third inter, uh, internship uh, meeting, progress uh, project status meeting with my interns. And so they're fairly new to this because they just came on board recently. So um, I, it's more important to be very explicit and stick to that uh, general agenda or process. So the process, I think, is, is important. If the process is communicated, and then everyone knows you know, how to move forward instead of being so abstract.
You know, when you say this, it reminds me of something sort of a, an assumption that I have about people who work remotely, which is they're a little bit more assertive in terms of the, the work that needs to be done and the preparations that need to be done. It's just a feeling from talking to people. And I think it's my own bias, but I really, I guess maybe it's assertive is the wrong word. Maybe it's entrepreneurial. Like people are a little bit more self-sufficient because they're remotely. And so they come to the table and maybe they're more autonomous. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. I'm not sure, but do you get that feeling? Absolutely. And I think that another way of, of describing that is disciplined. So oh. there's, I, I think there's, there's a, a discipline that that is born out of two things one being uh, entrepreneurial minded in that you have to make do with what you have and um, the discipline part is one of my mantras as well that that says um, adapt improvise and overcome so you have to adapt to to your environment you have to improvise and and by doing so you can overcome whatever the limitations the the getting back to a little bit to the profile of who would be successful in these types of situations or environments and and, and who wouldn't um, so clearly the the discipline folks the ones that can shut out and focus shut out the world you know the noise rather and cancel out the noise and stay focused on the on the work the um, the people who who do not shy away from um, low snags you know, they can roll with the punches and mm. they don't fear taking calculated risks. So the entrepreneurs are, <laughs> are natural at that. And um, they don't shy away from change, you know, because things are always going to be changing around you. The people that, that don't um, do well in those environments are the ones that will get frazzled easily or can't concentrate unless it's very quiet and um, or it's a perfect environment. Um, in, in, you know, if you're, if you're thinking like, oh, well, that's for like somebody really, you know, much senior in, in, in their uh, age, that's not necessarily true because I can tell you that another profile that would not work is the young and the reckless that are not disciplined yet. Right. So, so really, I think it comes down to uh, being disciplined and, and having that appreciation for um, for change and for um, limitations because limitations are actually a really, really good thing. Um, if you think about it, limitations are what actually makes us creative. Mm. And creative, creativity is what's going to help you address and meet some of these challenges. So when you don't have change happening around you all the time, your your creative part of your brain actually atrophies a little bit. So then you don't get creative in terms of problem solving. So limitations are actually the best. Uh, this is actually, and I don't recall the study, I wish I did right now, but I don't recall the study that, that I ran across one time that said, if, if entrepreneurs had all the money in, that they needed and all the resources that they needed, they would cease to be creative or innovative. Ah, oh, love it. And, and, and really, it stands to reason. And that's, that's why there's that old adage of, um, was it invention is the mother of innovation or? Creation. Oh. Yeah, invention, yeah, the mother of creation. Yeah. It, it's, I, I know I'm messing that, metaf that little saying, but it, it really comes back down to creativity and limitations. So... Um, the limitation, the more you conquer those, the more confidence you have, the more you get creative. So being in an office, your same office um, all day, in and out, the, the walls don't change. The, um, the path, the process to get to your desk, none of that changes. So your creative brain starts to kind of atrophy a little bit because you stop paying attention to those things. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Somebody else I interviewed, uh, his name is Teo Heron. He's a creativity expert from Sweden. He said exactly the same thing. He said, you, you're the, the best place for you to be productive on your task is a number of different places. It's not always in the office. I mean, maybe it's 90% in the office. Maybe you feel creative in the office 90% of the time, but for the rest of the 10%, you need to get out and do and go somewhere else to sort of stimulate the brain there. Yeah, it sounds very... Very similar to what he said. 
Absolutely. And in fact, I actually took this course from uh, Professor Barbara Oakley. The, it's a MOOC. Um, MOOC. Oh. And MOOC, yeah, I think you know what it means. Some um, uh, massive, massive online. Oh, open online course. And um, that class was called Learning How to Learn. Uh, I was drawn to that class because it has to do with how do you learn about uh, abstract science and, and math uh, concepts when they're abstract. And uh, because that's in my field, of course, I you know wanted to learn more about it. I also uh, purchased her book, which I highly recommend, called um, I'll, I'll show it here, A Mind for Numbers. Oh. And this, it's, the subtitle is How to Excel at Math and Science Even if You Flunked Algebra. So she, this is, uh, it tells about her story. She flunked algebra and she was not good at math. Yet, at, later on in life, she ended up uh, becoming a professor of engineering at, at a university. So it's cool. fascinating. But back to the point on the creativity, one of the things that uh, she has as, as tips for, uh, as a method for learning and, and doing good in tests, is actually you want to practice test, uh, test taking in different locations, not at the same place, because you, you want your brain to be able to uh, open up with other environments, other locations. So uh, not just in the same thing, because when, when that changes from under you, you then, you, it, the brain, the subconscious of the brain uh, actually gets thrown off and you're not in your game anymore. I, love, I think that's an awesome tip. In fact, I hired a speaking coach about a year ago to help me with some speaking gigs that I had. And he said, when you practice, practice in all different kinds of places, practice with a high vo voice and a low voice. He said, because when you get there, everything, if you just practice in your room alone, then when you get to the place, you're going to get distracted by all the things that are different. Yes. Then when, so that's, I love, I love how these things come from all these different places. So heed this advice, people. It's coming from multiple sources. It's right on. <laughs> love it. So let's see. Uh, oh, I want to talk about culture because you've mentioned that you've traveled a lot and that you've spent time. Sao Paulo and Brazil have come up a number of times. So I want to ask about that. But in terms of culture and working with different cultures, what kind of things are you running into? If anything, some people don't run into anything, but I always like to ask because culture is such an interesting sort of varied topic. Yes, yes, it is. So um, I actually, the one, one part of the world or two parts of the world, that I've not traveled to is uh, Asia and Africa. So um, not a lot has drawn me there <laughs> in particular, but Europe and a lot of South America, uh, absolutely. So I can, I, I know that the, the business culture is, is very different in, in, in these parts of the world. Um, in Sweden, I know that the entrepreneurial climate is a little bit more mellow. Uh, it's not that there's not an interest, it's just they're not as, as quite as aggressive as, let's say, in Silicon Valley <laughs> right. or, or New York. Um, so the, the momentum is, is different. In, um, in different parts of, of South America, where I have the most experience, I spent three years traveling about 75% of the time all over, there's a huge difference. Um, you would think that, well, they all speak Spanish, with the exception of uh, Brazil, which is Portuguese. But that's, the, the Spanish is very different. Spanish is my first language. And I could see a huge difference between the translation um, of my press releases, you know, when I was in corporate America, between Venezuela and Chile and Argentina and, or Colombia. The Spanish was very different. You take one U.S. American written press release and you have it translated and they look different. Interesting. Those countries. So I had to work with the local PR teams to uh, make sure that, that the essence of the, the messages were conveyed the way I had intended them to be conveyed. So you can't take that for granted uh, by any means. And then clearly, of course, the um, uh, the local culture, business culture. Um, you don't talk business before <laughs> before you know dinner, but then you talk a little bit, um, you know, during dinner, and then a lot more afterwards. <laughs> okay. In, in some of the countries, 
Uh, so you have to be on all the time. <laughs> Right. And it's good to know. And how did you learn about this? Was it really trial by fire? You go to these places and you just absorb where you can, or are there places you can go to, to help? If you're well, trying to um, there are books, by the way, doing business with, you know, any given country, at least that gives you some of the basics. And, but then at the end of the day, it's going to depend on the individual. So it's a, it's a person thing, you know, how, how are you reading them? What do they seem comfortable with? And you start, uh, you know, um, with, you know, getting to know them first. And mm -hmm. it's all about the person. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about the person, not about the culture. The person is not the culture. The person is the person and the one that you need to engage with, regardless of what part of the world they're in. Well, that's a really good reminder that it's still a person and that people are pretty similar the world over. Yeah. yeah. And um, so we're coming to the end of our time, which is crazy. I think I could, re I could go on and on and on with you. It's super <laughs> interesting. I feel like we just started. I looked at the clock like, oh, no, not yet. So I guess <laughs> I'll end. I have two more questions. And I guess the, one of the, the second to the last question would be advice for people who are starting out on remote teams. W what advice would you give? Um, well, I think the, probably the best advice for someone starting is throw out the rule book on meetings, you know, when you're dealing with online, because it's all different. If you're just starting out, it's, it's, it's all different. Get familiar with the tools. Obviously, that's a mechanics thing. But throw out the rule books in general. However, you do so only if you are certain that you are keeping your eye on the objective. What is the objective, you know, for that meeting or for that relationship or for that project? If you keep that in front, uh, then everything else will sort of, you know, fall into place and you're rolling with it um, because, again, you're only starting out. Um, this goes back to one of my other mantras that obstacles are what you see when you take your eye off the ball. And um, that was actually something that I learned from uh, back in college when I was playing handball. And my handball coach um, was the one that would tell me that because, like, you know, he said, no, if you're taking, literally taking your eye off the ball, you see the obstacles, whether it's somebody else or the wall or what have you. Uh, but it's a great metaphor for life. It's a great metaphor for, um, you know, uh, professional work. So, And I hear a lot that with remote working, you have to be results oriented. And it sounds like this is sort of that in that same field like be keep your objective in mind like what is the result that you need to get from this particular interaction yes like so i love that keep focused yeah i have a i have a difficult time i'm like a shiny kind of person <laughs> <laughs> i have a particular time with this so the last question then is a is an easy one but probably the most important which is if people want to learn more about you and and uh, nanotech nexus where do they go what's the best way to get in touch with you well, I can uh, certainly be reached by email. It's adriana at nanotechnexus.org. And my website and contact information, uh, my contact information and, and phone number are actually on the website as well, nanotechnexus.org. Okay. N-A-N-O-T-E-C-N-E-X-U-S. Nanotechnexus.org. Great. And I'll make sure to put it in the show notes as well. And for anybody that has questions now or in the future, I encourage you to tweet out to hashtag remote interview and we'll get any of those questions answered anytime that they come up. So thank you for your time. And uh, especially since I was an hour off today, I really appreciate that, uh, <laughs> that we still got to have the conversation. So I really oh, absolutely not a problem. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Great. And for everybody listening, until next time, be powerful.